Know no man after the flesh. Identify, perceive, look at no man after the flesh. Why? Because you'll miss the best part. No, no man after the flesh, but every man. That includes women. Don't get nervous. I saw you. (laughs) If I say that, when I say man, I mean all-inclusive of mankind. So if you can call me the bride of Christ, I can call you mankind. I don't have a problem with you calling me the bride of Christ. Okay, girls? All right, good. No, no man after the flesh. There's nothing good in here. It's just an earth suit. It's a gravity jacket. And it's the great decomposer. But this flesh holds something. Something we really don't even understand. An all-surpassing power lives in you. This treasure lives in an earthen vessel. By the genius of God, what tension it creates in our culture. No, no man after the flesh. But every man by the Spirit. It's funny to me that from the moment you enter this world, even before, when you're a seed and you're an embryo and you're growing up, you're growing up inside of man. Think about it. Muse with me for a minute. And as little as those hands are, they can navigate where they are because they're inside of something. It's not a great expanse, but to a child, being inside the womb is probably a large room. But nevertheless, they can navigate it north, south, east, and west. And then when that child comes into the world, one of the first things we do is we put it into another box. It's called a crib. And they can still navigate it. It's hard to get lost in the crib. And then they start to talk. And then they want to go outside and we put them in another box that's called a sandbox. They can still touch and they still kind of know where they are. And then they grow up and they hate being put in a box. And then something wonderful happens. They realize there's a need. And what is that need? I must be born again then. Because I was born once and I came out of a a human and they put me in a pen (laughs) and then I went from the pen to the sandbox and I went from the sandbox into the real world and I realized I was just as empty. So you must be born again and then, then what happens when you're born again? Well, when you're born into that place, there's no more borders. You can't navigate it. There's no more boundaries. All human thought and intentions out the window now because we're not in that place. Like, oh, yeah, okay, you're three feet. Okay, I can figure you out. Now we're in a place where there's no more calculation. There's no more figuring. We're used to all of that in our life. And then there's another box, too. It's called a coffin, by the way. I forgot to tell you about that one. We're all about putting people in boxes here. That's what we do in America, in the world. And God's all about getting things out of a box. By the way, he doesn't like being in a box either. I didn't add that. He had one once. It's called the Ark of the Covenant. It was beautiful. I mean, the way they built it, they built it by his specifications. There was a building that housed great power. All the power was in the box. But like you, there was a day probably when... You wanted that power to be outside of the box. And something wonderful happened. Someone provided the ability for us to be born again. And at that sacrifice, that 60-foot badger skin rug that divided the inner place from the Holy of Holies was split in half and the Spirit of God moved from the inside out and made a way for all of us. Because something happened that was a little bit different. See, because everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. See, you were born a man. That's why he can call you son of man. Because you came from man, mankind. I did. I love my mom. (laughs) She did a good job. 
that she's mankind. But everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God by loving God and carrying out his commands. And it's interesting, we talked about this. Sometimes God's commands seem stringent and legalistic to you. And sometimes they cause a conundrum, and sometimes you get frustrated. Because you don't like those commands because they buttress up against your humanity and your perception of life in the box. When all along the reason that he's made these commands is to get you to break the barriers of the box and come live with him in intimacy. This is love for God to obey his commands. Why? Because he wants you to have an incredible life. We always are used to this performance-based relationship. I'm going to do all this stuff, not because I want to, because it makes God happy. It doesn't make God happy. God's already happy. He doesn't need us to make him happy. He's the all-sufficient one. He makes himself happy. Circumstances are always really good there. It's not about making it happy. He wants you to be happy. What father wouldn't? And his command should not be burdensome for everyone born of God overcomes the world. Isn't that the point? (laughs) This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood. Oh, see, there's the difference. How did you come into the world? Oh, the water broke. Honey, honey, get the car running. My water broke. You came by water, friend. I came by water. But there's someone else who came, and he came by water and blood. And the blood makes all the difference because the blood is what holds the power. That precious blood by which you can be born again a second time. Even Nicodemus couldn't understand what he was speaking of, of being born again. He said, I'm going to take you out of a womb and put you in a room with a view. (laughs) I'm going to take you out of a place that you can navigate into the expanse of the divine where nothing is impossible. And I'm going to do it through a power that is almost inexplicable. And it comes through DNA that comes from my father. It is my blood. I was born of water like you, but I was born of water and blood. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. That power isn't something that you are about to receive. That power is what you have already laid hold of if you are a blood-bought son and daughter of the Most High God. What I find is very interesting is if somebody would actually have to question the fact that they were imbued with God's power, if they would actually even argue the fact that, well, if there was contention or that God actually needed us so he could do something, then we would actually put God in a subservient position of being beneath man. We would actually say then that force was stronger than power by saying that God is waiting for me to do something or waiting for me to say something means that God then is controlled by the will of man. But instead, we find that there is absolutely no competition. I want to read you just a few scriptures this morning. But we have, past tense, this treasure in jars of clay. Why? I always ask that question. Why? Why? I mean, it sounds genius, but why is it genius? To show that this all-surpassing, unequaled power is from God and not us. People don't understand what they have. If you don't, it'd be like an inheritance. It'd be like if I was your dad and I kicked off, took a dirt nap and left you $5 million. 
Now, if you didn't know about it, you couldn't spend it, could you? In fact, you would be ignorant, which is not a bad word. It means to not know. You would be uninformed in the fact that your father had kicked off, went to the great beyond, and left you $5 million. And so, therefore, it's always there. You could have used it any time if you would only known that you possessed it. What do they say? Possession is nine-tenths of the law. <laughs> you got to know what you have, man. That was my favorite part of the movie The Matrix. Here's a guy that went to somebody to find... How many times do you guys do that? I've done it. Gone to somebody to find out who you are? <laughs> That's awesome. Well, he probably knows better than me, so I'm going to go with that person. Well, the oracle is there, and the all-knowing oracle is going to tell Neo who Neo is. But the answer was right behind his head up on the wall. It said, know thyself, in Latin. But he was... He was too convinced that he wasn't the one to turn around to realize that he was. And it's easy for us that have been imbued with great power, which we'll talk about in a moment, to look for someone else that you believe has the power that you think you don't have. And they're a specialist somehow, whether it be healing or whether it be uh, administration or preaching the gospel or salvation. I had somebody I was talking to recently was telling me that certain people are are better at witnessing the others. I said, yeah, the only difference is that they, they know that it's the power and not them. There isn't people that are, are, are evangelists that are just good at evangelizing. There are people that wake up and realize that all they have to do is be Christ and people will come to the Lord. We don't need specialists. We don't have to blur those lines. If you do this long enough, and if you want to know really, ask him. If you do this long enough, you do it all. You can do it all. And much more according to the word of God. Why? Because the older you get, Hopefully, the more cognizant you're becoming of the fact that it's him that does the work. And you, it's like, you know what it's like? This is a good one. It'd be like if your dad grabbed you and put you, put you on his feet, and then he mowed the lawn. And when it was perfect, he had you get off and go, look what you did. <laughs> That's what it's like. He makes everything beautiful, and you get all the credit for it. Wow. And we know. I hope we do this morning. That's why I'm here. I love wisdom and knowledge, revelation, but most of all, I love the understanding of both. I hope I can switch your battery on today. I know the Spirit is able. And we know, we are convinced, we are sure that in all things, God works. Oh, I love that. See, you have to just read it right. Oh, I, I work. Uh, God works. Why? What does he work? Oh, he works for the good. Of who? Of those? Who, which those? Who love him? Ah, I'm understanding your word. Maybe I'm reading it right. Let me see. And we know, okay, yes, I'm not guessing, wishing, hoping. I know now, I believe this, it's real, that in everything, all things, that God's working for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to, to his purpose. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to, you know what? I know where I want to go. I want to go somewhere. I want to go to John 5 for a reason. I love it. People go, how do you always have the same, the same topic and preach a completely different message? Because this is the word of life. It's alive. It's living. It's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides between the soul and the spirit. It has power. It can go where it wants to go. It wants to go to John 5. Right at the beginning. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem near the sheep gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, which is surrounded by the five covered colonnades. And here a great number of disabled, your Bible may say invalid. When I read that, I just closed the book. Because invalid means useless. It means they have no purpose. Are you with me this morning? Caleb's with me this morning. If you've been impaired physically, for example, then one of the topic words for you is that you have no use. To be impaired f- physically would enhance your use technically because it would actually cause your spirit to penetrate probably. You know what? People go, who do you hang out with? I said, handicapped people. Why? I said, because they have a place with God that I don't even know about yet. Because we have our lenses backwards. We're myopic. Now, 
So here's Jesus going down to a place that says it's full of invalids, people that had no purpose. Here a great number of people that felt they had no purpose, who had been disabled, which means you were not able. And they used to lie there, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for over 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, now think about this, if it was you. And it had been 38 years, Tom Allen. How would you handle this question? Do you want to get well? Would you be sarcastic with Jesus? Would you, would you, would you snap your gum? Would you just be angry? It's like, here's your sign. I mean, what, you know what I mean? What, you, what would you be feeling? if, Sir, the invalid replies, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred while I'm trying to get in. Someone else always goes down ahead of me. Well, that's logical. How does Jesus answer? Get up! Pick up your mat and walk. He was, the man was under the assumption that because everyone else was there in the same condition, that the way that they would get healed is they would have to find a force, something that was moving, that was natural, which they could climb into this place and then they would come out whole. So there was a pool of water, but then living water came and made a house call. Now it's not a force of water. Now it is power. Now it is living water. And he is telling him without any explanation and, and not with a lot of apparent outward sympathy. Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. What else could we say that that power is accompanied with? Great authority. How many of you have ever been walking down a sidewalk and seen somebody else walking down the same sidewalk and they're running into every single person? Boom, boom. When I walk down the sidewalk, nobody runs into me. Ever. When I was a youth pastor, we'd have visiting speakers come. And they'd speak to our kids, and our kids would go haywire. And I would come to the podium, and it was dead silence. Why? Because I used force? Or because it was power? Which one? Did I force them? Absolutely not. Never mentioned it. But there is a power that every one of you possess. And no excuse for not walking in it. And that's what today is all about. And that's exactly what happened here. 38 years of a man's life. And living water says, get up. Well, what about when they get up? Well, the angels got to start, get up. At once, the man was cured, picked up his mat, and walked. But here's the fun part. The day that this took place, I'm sure this was mere coincidence, of course. Jesus not wanting to be controversial. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath day. Now, the Sabbath day would be the day where we don't do anything. And they're so legalistic about it. I spend time in Israel. They even have Shabbat elevators. You don't touch the buttons. It goes up on every floor, and you have to wait for every stinking floor. Oh, this is great. I'd rather work. Don't work. You can't touch the buttons. First star, you, you, you got to make sure that your food is nearby because you can't start the car to go to the drive through because you have to turn a key. That's work. What do you think they think about a guy that's healing a dude on Sabbath day? That's big work. Big work. What do you think you're doing, Jesus? You're blowing the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man that had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. (laughs) That's religion, friend. A man is miraculously healed after how many years? And they're giving him a hard time because he's carrying his mat. Anyone? But he replied, the man who made me well, said to me, pick up your mat and walk. Who? who? The people that literally had all of the legislated force power? A magistrate power or power? 
The man who did this, who used power, obviously more than you have to do this, told me to do this. That's why I did it. I didn't care about your stinking law. I don't care about your force and your outward appearance. A stranger with more than I've ever seen told me to pick up my mat, and I picked it up, and I'm healed. So they asked him, well, who is this fellow who told you to pick up your mat and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was. Did you hear what I just said? The man that got healed had no idea who it was. But he knew that whoever it was, he had power and authority over anything. And that power and authority was so strong that this man had no fear of the magistrate or the possibilities of being imprisoned or even killed for breaking the Sabbath. Now, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd. How many people, now work with me, church, at home. How many people in the church that walked up to a man that had been paralyzed for 38 years in his service, and he got healed, would slip out. Oh, you'd be getting it on camera, Jack. Come on. You'd be writing a book, How I Healed a 38-Year-Old Cripple. Come on. You know you would. You slip out anonymous healing. I don't know who did it. No, you know you would. Just another notch in my super powerful gun. I just walked up to him, and I just said, Behold, and boom. I mean, come on. How many people would really do that? Answer, just about nobody. Everybody want to take the credit. Jesus slipped out. Later, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see when nobody was around. See, you're well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Something worse than what? 38 years as a cripple? Yeah, an eternity without him. Did you hear me? So because Jesus was doing these things, I, had, I wanted to start here, but I had to tell you what the things were. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, what? Exuding all surpassing power and healing people that have been sick for a long time, for starters. Hacking off the Pharisees. <laughs> because he was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jews persecuted him. And Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work to this very day. My father is always working and I too am working. And for this reason, the Jews tried all the harder to what? Use force to do what? To kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God, his own father, making himself equal with God. Then Jesus gave him this answer. I tell you the truth. The son of man can do nothing by himself. All of us would be served well to say the same thing every moment of our life. For the Son of Man that was born of water only could do nothing on on his own. All of you, me, can do nothing. You without Christ equals nothing. You without Christ is worth less than a dollar and 11 cents in mineral value. With Christ, priceless. Now, The son can do nothing by himself. When I read that the first time, I thought it was heresy in the Bible. What do you mean? Jesus can do anything. He can't do anything, he says, unless he sees his father doing it. Because whatever the father does, the son does. Are you getting it? For the father loves the son and shows him everything that he does. This power, this divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his glory and his goodness. If you don't know that you, I mean, I know people, they look at me like, yeah, I know I read that. But if it's only in your head, it, you, it's just like the guy that still doesn't have any use of the inheritance. He doesn't, he doesn't have the code. He doesn't have the access code to his fortune. He's just merely carrying it, but it's not being utilized by him or by anyone that comes in contact with him.
There's two prayers in the Bible, and every time I read them, I think about your congregation. I mentioned that in the first service. Why? First of all, because your city's different every time I visit it. And it's better every time I come. And the people are kinder to me every time I come here. Not because they know me, but because they're changing. I'm watching this city become beautiful before my eyes. This place that I despised in the 90s, that when it would come on my itinerary, I would say, oh, God, please, not Watertown. Not the Rainbow Motel. Not the Strand. No! I felt a big black shroud of death over this whole region. I felt a coldness, and not from the weather, but from the people. And I have literally watched since 1991 the transformation of a region because of a vision and a revelation. And I have watched you guys grow, not only in number, but in power, which is what this message is all about. And power is something that influences everything and everyone around it. And I pray this prayer, not once or twice, but often over you. Ephesians 1, verse 15. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power. Whenever he says that, you need to just wake it up right there. It's not a force. It's a power. Somebody said to me one time, oh, you're a force to be reckoned with. I said, no, I'm I'm an infinite power that leaves force in its jet stream. (laughs) That's what I am. I'm not a force to be reckoned with. I'm an infinite power that can't be stopped. I'm a dynamo. So are you. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is in you. It's called dunamis power. It raises the dead. But that's only a handful of things that it's capable of that power is like the working of the mighty strength his mighty strength which he exerted in christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms far above what all rule every force every authority power and dominion can we just say that one more time just in case anyone's still on the fence this power which power the one that you have you know that one it says that we've all drank from the same spirit. You know, the one that you have, one you walked in with today, the one I have. It's above every other power, dominion, force, entity, realm. Hmm, that's what the Bible says. And then it goes on to say, in every title that can be given. Who's your enemy now? Sooner or later, I hope it's sooner, the church is going to wake up and realize there's only one power to be concerned with. Many forces, but one power. There is an all-surpassing, trumping, supreme power that you already have that you're not waiting for. It's not coming down like the hail bop comet. It already came up into you when Jesus moved into your neighborhood. It's innate and powerful. But what does he say? It's above everything. Mm Mm-hmm. Everything. Everything. And it's what? It's an inheritance. Let me ask you a question. Who's ever heard of anybody contending for their inheritance? Did you contend for salvation or was it provided for you? Did you contend for your inheritance or was it your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom? Contending for something you already have is insanity. Fighting for something you already possess is just proof positive that you don't know that you have it in the first place. If you're fighting for something, what would you be struggling for or exerting force to gain the power that you already have? Force versus power. That's what today's about. You've done it. Have you ever tried to open a door that's stuck? And <laughs> I'm not small. I mean, I got, you know... 
and I can't get it open. Then some, some little six-year-old kid walks up with a teddy bear and opens it with a pinky and just go, what was that about? That's the difference between force and power. But it's different too. Force for me just is really, the common denominator has usually been exhaustion and perspiration. Power for me has been rest and revelation. Power is something that I don't have any physical control over. It's something that I am blessed and you are blessed with that does what it wants to do if you allow it to. See, that's the big difference. And in the same way, when the world is looking for what you found, how much flesh do they have to navigate through before they find it? That's a good question, isn't it? How much of you are they going to have to go through until they find him? That's got to make you think. How much of my crummy personality and my junk and my baggage and my past does some poor seeker have to dig through like, like a bum in a rubbish pile to find the diamond that's buried under all that stuff? And do they have the patience? And that power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted. There's that word again. He worked, not you, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule, all authority, power and dominion and every title that could be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. This reads like a legal document. It has no loopholes. It has no way out. Well, what about the devil included in that? Whether you like that or not, I hate to steal your devil, but I have to because he already defeated him. He is not omnipresent. He is a force, not a power. There's only one power. The Bible says it over and over and over and over again. The all-surpassing, unstoppable, overarching, indivisible power is his power. And there's only one way you can be overcome by anything. And it's that if you believe that there is something outside of that that could actually harm you in any way. But given full authority in your life by moving your flesh out of the way and letting God reprioritize your soul, which is your thought, will, and emotions, when your soul becomes cleaved to the Spirit, you're the most powerful thing in the world. And when he talks about creation and he says, let us make them in our image, that's how they work. And when you get there, that's how you will work. Not with force, but with great power. There's another prayer. And let it be a prayer over you now. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom his family, his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches that he might strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, not from your flesh in your outer man. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together. Oh boy, now we come into something really awesome. Power together. Power together. What is the church? The Iglesia, the shining headless bride of Christ, waiting for its authority to find its place of rest. But what does that mean to you? What it means is if what you're doing in your own due diligence every day with your own vertical relationship with Christ, you grab this morsel and then you come into contact with others who have done the same on a Sunday morning, Nothing shall be impossible to those who believe. It's a simple equation. If you get this and you get this and you get this and you guys come together in unity. You, unity doesn't mean always. I mean, you're married. You know what I'm talking about. You guys don't always agree on the same thing. At least not at the beginning. You come to some sort of, yeah, at least a coup. Something happens somewhere, you know. But my, here's my point, though. It's not about whether you have all of your doctrine correct. The point is, will you all release the power of the Holy Spirit together? Now we're talking. I could really care. Like, people get all up about, you have long hair. Well, he's black. Well, she's white. Well, he's, I could care less. I could care. What, what difference does that make? That's just stuff that just causes more division. 
Who cares? It's organic material. My hair, I could, I could make it short if I want. I could, you know, remember those Barbie dolls that used to have the button in the back? You could make long hair. You could, I mean, I can do whatever I want with this stuff. It's not going to change who I am one iota, whether it's long or short, if I could jump rope with it or whether you can shine my head. It doesn't matter. And we get all hung up on everything that doesn't matter and we totally overlook the latent power of the Holy Spirit in you. And we start looking upon the very thing I said at the beginning. We start judging after, I don't like his face. I don't care if you like my face or not. You won't be seeing it in eternity because I get a new body. (laughs) So you only have to suffer with it for a little bit longer. I don't like your hair. Well, you don't have to dry it. <laughs> so I pray that you'll be rooted and established. That means found, in foundational. This will be bedrock. This is like Christianity 101. And that you will have power together. That's what it's all about. The shining bride of Christ, the real church. I love coming here because that's what I see. And you can check the... Well, they record everything. I don't get away with anything. You can see I don't say that too many places. Sometimes I run in, drop a bomb, and run out the back door as quick as I can. <laughs> this, this is a family. <laughs> so, so we'd have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide. Now, listen to these dimensions and see if it reminds you of anything. How wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ? That sounds like a cross to me. Yeah, you got that too. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all fullness. Oh, for a church where everybody comes full all the time, who knows who they are, who's not afraid. Past the point of being offended, has no fear of man, realizes that Nothing is impossible to people like that that believe. Now, to him who is able. (laughs) That's the good part. By the way, we're not talking about some austere God that lives out in the black hole in the north side of the galaxy. We're talking about the one that lives inside of you, man, the one that set you free. Now unto him, that one, who is able to do immeasurably more than all that we could ask, think, or imagine. We've got some big brains in here, too. There's some real imagination in this church. This just trumped the biggest brain. According to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now, I could go on, but the beauty of being here again is that you guys retain very well because you have, honestly, you have really good church government, you have really good leadership, and you guys are really sharp. I think I taught the kingdom of God message here in record time, if I'm not mistaken. I think we had about 90% absorption in about an hour and 15 minutes, which is unheard of. Now, go to 1 Kings 19 with me. There's a revelation to be had today if you have eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. Whether you're 8 or 18 or 80, it doesn't really matter. Spirit is spirit. That's where we get hung up. We keep trying to mix the soul and the spirit. We get them confused. (laughs) Has anyone here ever been at the right place at the wrong time? Thank God. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. It's funny. You were in the right building with the right people, but the door wouldn't open for nothing. Isn't that amazing? We've been there a few times. We heard God, too. Went there. Miss the timing. You have to listen really close because you've heard this story a lot, but you've never heard it this way before. And it's not a trick Bible. I just copied this right off Bible Gateway. NIV. <laughs> First Kings 19. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a message to Elijah to say, may the gods, small g, plural, forces, not power, deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life 
like that of one of them. So it wasn't Jezebel that came to Elijah. It was a minion. It was a servant, an underling, a servant of Queen Jezebel that came to the guy that said, "Ah, I don't think it's going to rain for three and a half years, and God shut up the heavens. Same guy that said, uh, you can try anything you want to get your gods to respond, but it seems like they must be relieving themselves. So they begin to cut themselves and nothing happened. And he goes, hey, watch this. I call down fire. Oh, there it comes. Boom, consumes everything. Same guy that calls fire down from heaven. Same guy. And here's the response from a message from a messenger from a woman queen. Elijah was afraid. And he ran for his life. Is that a good idea? To run for your life? When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. And while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush or a broom tree in your translation, sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and he fell asleep. And all at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals in a jar of water. It's the first time you're ever going to see a formula for angel food cake anywhere. So he ate and he drank and then he lay down again. Now, obviously, something's happening here, and you're you're gonna all of a sudden you're gonna see it. It's gonna be like one of those, have you ever looked at one of those pictures that you keep staring at it for a while, and all of a sudden you see, oh my gosh, did you see that? There's a horse. There's a horse in there because there was an image, but it's embedded, and you have to look and stare and focus for a long time. I suggest reading the Bible that way. I mean, a lot of people get mad when I say this, and I don't really care, but. I think the worst idea for marketing was selling a Bible that you had to read in one year. Reading the Bible in one year. A lot of people love that. Maybe you guys did that at this church. You know, maybe I'll get in trouble later. That's okay. The bottom line is this. If I read one paragraph in my entire life and understood it fully, it would have been the best Bible study I ever had. Now, I mean, seriously, and I'm not kidding you because I did it. How many days did you get up and you were late for work and you just weren't feeling it, whatever you went, so blah, 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 blah. okay, I did my part. There was no comprehension, understanding. There wasn't even any wisdom. There was an exercise. It was like doing push-ups when you don't feel like it. Come on. I'm just telling the truth. So if you want to read the Bible in the year, go ahead. It is possible, but you, won't. <laughs> you might as well just <laughs> do some push-ups. All right. Because you're not going to retain it. You're not going to retain it in a year. Anyway. That's just my opinion. I also, by the way, since I'm already in trouble, I might as well go all the way. Um, I've been noticing in a lot of meetings lately that everybody's putting their Bible on their iPhones and their stuff. I'm telling you something right now. That's not how I learned the book. Get some leather under your fingers. Well, you don't understand. I've got five translations. I also know that it shows your Facebook updates too. And I also know that right in the middle of a good sermon, you're clicking over to see who just instant messaged you. I'm not stupid. I was a youth pastor. So the best way to learn the Bible is by using one. I love iPhones. They're great. They've got apps. You don't need a Bible app. You got the real thing. Get some leather under your fingers if you want to know how this thing works. All right. Enough of that commercial. Sorry, Steve Jobs. All right. Now. At once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around by his head. There's an angel food cake and some water. He drank it and he lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat. And here's the key for the journey's too much for you. Since we're doing this out of your own strength, God didn't call you on this journey. You chose this one on your own. Why? Because you were afraid. That's the truth. I mean, we like to pontificate, shine things, make things really nice. Well, this is the reason why. You know the motive. My favorite thing, I mean, ever since I was a youth pastor, I've had the same thing every day. My wife knows it. Every kid that's ever been part of the ministry knows it. There's two questions I have to ask myself every day before I do anything. 
Why do I do what I do? And who do I do it for? Those two questions. That's my daily mantra. And sometimes I answer them wrong, so I don't do anything until I get it right. And when I can say out of my heart, Jesus, for both of those, then I can go minister to his people. But if it's for me or for money or for anything else, I can't really go, then can I? So here we go. The journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb. Did anybody get that? What kind of grain was this guy eating? Anyone? Bueller? 40 days on one cake? I want this grain. I want the amazing grain. I could rule the world with this grain. 40 days? You can eat one time and be (laughs) for 40 days? (laughs) Wow. Which should, again, underscore what I'm talking about all along. Only God could empower the same meal that he uses from the same trees, the same shrubs, that he would eat and be hungry in two hours and make it last for 40 days. Now, the word of the Lord came to him, and you're not going to like it, neither did he. After all of that, 40 days, God, I mean, God had to send an angel, make me a cake, all this stuff. He gets to his destination. And what he's probably thinking in his head is, man, is God ever going to be glad to see me? Because I'm the last of the Mohicans. I'm the last one like me. The word of the Lord came to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? (laughs) The all-knowing, all-seeing God has just asked him a question. He's probably beginning to put a little fear in his heart. And here's his reply. I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. And I, only I, am left now, and they're trying to kill me too. So we look for the response of what God says. He completely blows it off. (laughs) And Tell me, if if I just said that to you, if this wouldn't sound random, if you told me that. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. (laughs) But what about I'm the only one? I'm zealous. Uh, uh, Tore down your altars, did everything you said. Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. For the Lord, remember that, the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. What? And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the... And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the... Well, hold a second. Hold on a minute. I don't understand this scripture. It says right here, all right, man of God, go out, stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. The Lord's going to pass by. So obviously he's passing by, and these rocks go crazy, and there's, but he's not in that? And then the wind kicks up, and he's not in that? And then there's this unbelievable fire, but, but he's not in that? And after the fire came, a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. When you have power, just your presence will cause all of those forces to take place. The jet stream of God's presence passing by caused an earthquake, (laughs) a great wind, and a fire. Was God in it? No! It was the response to God's power. It was the response to God's presence just passing by. Elements that we look at as great power are mere forces in comparison to this all-surpassing power of God simply taking a stroll. What happens when you take this power into this community? I don't know what to do. Good! I don't know what to say. Better! Abraham, Lord, where do I go? Uh, Out there. He didn't give him a GPS or a map. He just said, just go. You just got to go. Go is the beginning of the gospel. Well, I don't know, brother. I I don't know. I got faith. Well, you know, the only time faith comes before works is in the dictionary. You got to put some legs in that thing and move it. Now, (laughs) 
We've just seen an unbelievable trinity of force take place that God says, I'm not in. And then a still small voice that he wasn't used to hearing because everything he'd ever heard was what? Call down fire! He's used to hearing God in this bombastic fashion. But now the father's whispering, and he's in the whisper. There's God passing by. This is amazing. The voice comes. Which one? The whispering voice. Oh, what does it say? Exactly what he said when he got there. No, he wouldn't ask him the same question. You guys ever seen that game show when the guy goes, is that your final answer? And it, you know, you see the guy, he's vacillating. Man, I hope so. This is worth a million bucks. You have to see how much God loves man in this. You have to see it. He asked him a question. Elijah answers the question. God completely blows off the question and shows him something very important. And he asks him the question after showing that. Here's the answer. I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with a sword, and I, only I, am left. If you have your Bibles and you can look down there, you'll actually see, I printed it out just to, it is identical. His answer is, God gave him a second chance to answer him properly, and he did not take it. He gave him an out. He skirted the answer. He gave him a pass. Look, it is identical. 1 Kings 19.10 and 1 Kings 19.14. What's your point? It's a big one. (laughs) It's not the one on my head. (laughs) Here's the point. God is so loving that he said, Elijah, I want to give you another chance to come to your senses. Calm down from this perilous 40-day journey and your fear and tell me what's going on. Why are you here? Tell dad, what are you doing here? And he said the exact same thing that obviously wasn't the proper answer in the first place. Now, when you read the rest of this story, you realize that this is basically the end of Elijah's earthly journey as far as a minister. He's done amazing things. God's bragged about him. The council of heaven knows his name. But God asked him a very specific question. Maybe your father's asked you that question in your own life. What are you doing here, son? But the Lord answers the question a different way again. The Lord says to him, go back the way you came and go over the desert of Damascus. And when you get there, anoint Haziel, the king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, And here it comes. And anoint Elijah, son of Shaphet, from Abel Meholah, to succeed you as prophet. Are you with me so far? I'm just asking you to tell me the truth. Not once, but twice I gave you an opportunity. And you didn't do it. So I want you to go anoint the guy that just got your job. I want you to go and pour oil over the head of Elisha because he takes on from here. Nobody ever sees this, but you haven't even seen the best part yet. And listen what he says. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael. And Elisha will put to death anyone who escapes the sword of Jehu. How did our story start? With Elijah slaying false prophets by the sword. Think about something with me. Muse with me for a minute. Knowing this father heart of God in your own life, what would have happened if the second time when God said to Elijah, what are you doing here? It went something like this. Father, I ran to you because I knew that you're the only safe place for me and I'm scared out of my mind. This crazy witch queen said she's going to kill me tomorrow and I didn't know where I could go except to your bosom to find safety. Was that the truth? You bet it was. He ran because he was afraid and he tried to save his own life because he thought he was the only one. Maybe the the rest of his work was to finish the job of those two men, to slay the rest of those guys. We'll never really know. What about you? What great things does God have in store for you? When he asks you a question, will you answer him truthfully? knowing that he sees all and knows all. 
I asked Kirk that question last service. And we both had the same answer. We'd hug our son and tell him we love him and we would put our arms around him and comfort him. It's hard to comfort a zealot. It's hard to comfort a force that comes in its own power. It's hard to hold arrogance. Zeal. Fanatical. Passionate. Impassioned. Devout. Devoted. Committed. These are all things, these are all good characters. Hardcore. Enthusiastic. Eager. Keen. Over keen. Mm. Avid. Card carrying. Vigorous. Energetic. Intense. And fierce. All those are great qualities. And this, they're driving you in the wrong direction at the wrong time. <laughs> Zeal's great. If your zeal is in the Lord and not your own strength. Zeal's powerful. If it's connected to power and not force. And here's the part that was probably the hardest for Elijah to hear. And by the way, yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have never kissed him. What he was saying to Elijah is, just to add insult to injury and to make sure that you understand, you are never the only one. And I've never left myself so vulnerable as to make my entire kingdom dependent upon just one man. I had 7,000 identical to you because I'm a power and you're a force. And force never dominates power. Power always overcomes force. What's that like in your life? You're you're a formidable force without Christ. You're a full-blown enemy of the gospel, for goodness sakes. Card-carrying, avid, zealous about not loving, hating, being angry, depressed. You're avid about it. Oh, I ran full-blown into my perversion. (laughs) I was a card-carrying pervert. (laughs) Zealous. But I came in contact with power after I had already exerted the last stages of my force, which was to try to end a life that wasn't mine to take. And people worry all the time about blaspheming God. It's not easy to blaspheme God when you don't know him. He's not easily offended. I said things about God to God. I hung out a bird in the parking lot of the bar I was trying to get drunk in. I was mad at God because I couldn't get drunk, and I knew it was his fault for keeping me sober. I was a zealous, zealot, yeah, sinful zealot. But then something wonderful happened. After I couldn't succeed at killing myself, which is embarrassing on its own right, I woke up in the morning a different man. No longer a force to be reckoned with because my force had given way to a power that was all surpassing. It was more powerful than my will because I surrendered it. I surrendered it. You guys are soldiers. You know what it means to surrender. I waved the white flag. I stink at managing this life that you gave me. I'm the worst. I'm the chief of sinners. I surrender. I give way to your power. And I prayed this crazy prayer. I said, not only would you save me, but would you possess me with your power? Oh, and he did. And he did the same thing with you. And I'm just here today not to show you or tell you anything that you don't already know. And not to do what a lot of people do that I really don't like in ministry is try to draw you to their personality and make you think they have something you don't. Just the opposite. I want you to know that far more than anything that we've ever seen in our life together, far more than anything I'll probably ever do, you are all capable of doing more. Because we've all drank from this same spirit and are all imbued with the exact same power. 
And to the degree that you allow your flesh to die will be to the degree that the spirit emerges. And what's amazing is I heard somebody one time and they, and it sounds good in worship. I mean, it sounds even really humble. God, we need more of you. And God, we just want you to love me, God. And it was like, wow, that worship leader's got some issues. But it was like she was emoting for herself, not corporately. And that's cool. I mean, I, I, know, I know what they're doing. But it was basically her own idiosyncrasies and her own phobias and her own projection that she was projecting in a service, which I think is kind of strange, but that's all right. But it was saying, we just need more of you. And I thought, well, that's an easy equation. Then die. <laughs> Less of you and more of Jesus. It's real simple. We make it so mystical. and that One third of you is Christ. Every one of you have a miracle man at large working. He says, I and my father are always working. He never slumbers or sleeps. You got a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week first responder that lives inside of you, first of all. Secondly, what is he doing? What's part of his work? Is it extraneous? You betcha. What's the other part? It's internal. He's working his way out of you. He's beautifying you from the inside out. Why? So the more you relinquish, the more he releases until the point where you come into contact with some Christians and there's a lot more Jesus than there is that person anymore because that thing's dying. It's dying. The will, that hardcore thing that demands its way, even when God's already told you what he wants you to do. Your emotions that are all over the grid when you're supposed to be at peace. And worry about nothing but pray about everything. And your thought life, I don't even have to go there. But you don't understand, oh, I really do. I really do understand that if he says nothing shall be impossible to those who believe, he means nothing shall be impossible to those who believe. And the obvious, the only thing that's ever wrong with God is whatever he's in. (laughs) There's nothing wrong with God. So... We've got to look at the container, don't we? We have to. We have to do our own diagnostic test. You ever taken your car into the garage and they hook it up to a sun meter and tells you everything that's wrong with your car? <laughs> Maybe you need to hook yourself up to the sun, find out what's wrong with the car. It's just a vehicle. That's all you are. You've got to find out why it's not rolling right. It's not taking him anywhere. Or even worse, why the locks don't open and he can't get out. He spent enough time in a box, friend. He doesn't want to live his whole life inside here as he wants to get out in the neighborhood, roam around, heal some people, win some souls, bring some beauty and some legitimacy to his church on the earth. And he wants to use you to do that, if that would be okay with you, if that works in your schedule. Father, I want to thank you this morning. First of all, I want to repent on behalf of of myself and every other believer that can hear for not operating in the fullness of your power and for trying to live our life through the flesh. I ask the Lord today in your presence, in my own life, that I would never trust in my ability. But I would always surrender humbly, honestly, to your overworking all-encompassing, all-surpassing power, which came free of charge to us, but at a great price to you. Lord, I ask even today, after we literally, we just walked through yesterday a day of atonement, and automatically that happened in our presence yesterday. People just started saying things and opened up all kinds of doors of repentance, and it was nothing that any man did, but it was by your spirit because of power. In the same way, Lord, I ask that everyone that's here, everyone that's listening at home, that we would take stock today of our own vertical relationship with the Father and not blame it on anybody else why we're not being fed and not blame it on anybody else or the worship team or a pastor or a group of men or women or children of why we don't have what we think we need. We've been given all things pertaining to life and godliness in Christ. We are complete. We are full, empowered, and emblazoned with His glory. And we say from this point on, Father, we will make no more excuses for our vacillation between our force and your power. And we thank you, Lord, that this very power is that power 
that's at work in Watertown, New York, and all the surrounding regions and Finger Lakes, moving in different places in our country at this time for a strategic reason. And that you're getting us out of our heads, like Brother Paul said, for your sake. We're getting out of our own cerebral ability to think things through and to do the impossible because you are a miracle worker in our midst. And we thank you, Lord, for the finished work of the cross, that you didn't leave it to a multiple choice question or some arbitration. That it is a finished work that we've received and not something left to be done. And now we ask today for the great wisdom, knowledge, and revelation to walk as sons and daughters of a Most High God, fully empowered and not waiting for anything. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.